The resort at Disneyland Paris is doing a little bit of financial trickery in order to keep the Walt Disney Company afloat. Let's talk about whether or not it's actually profitable here on That Park Place. Hello, I am Jonas J. Campbell, an investigative reporter for That Park Place, and here with me is the man that I go to whenever I have questions about Disneyland Paris. Vash, quel air est Uh, I can't speak French, so <laughs> I, I'm not even going to try. Uh, oui, oui is about all I know, and oui, oui. Well, do we <laughs> have a story for you? Uh, we do have a story for you. Let's talk about this article out of Forbes, but we're, we're, we're going to be bouncing around just a little bit here not that article this article revealed the most successful boss of disneyland paris this is by caroline reed and caroline reed is doing some fantastic work there covering specifically disneyland paris uh over at forbes uh she did a deep dive into i want to say 30 years of financial statements for disneyland paris and uh I i'm just gonna go to one specific item here uh, as net revenue was not a good metric for how to track these parks. They're one of these parks that's been funded by loans. And then the profit from the loan is what's taken by the Walt Disney Company. It is a very complicated financial structure that is trying to uh, get Disney money somehow. But let's talk about it right here. Net profit doesn't do the trick either because it is affected by finance charges and income. So it doesn't necessarily reflect the actual performance of the business, I do I do realize we are jumping on this train while it is in motion. The best way to measure it, that being profit, is using its operating profit as that is determined by deducting running costs of the business from its revenue. That means that they're having to come up with figures for how in the world they're saying that Disneyland Paris is profitable at this point, uh, ranking every chief executive officer of Disneyland Paris based on the total operating profit generated under their tenure reveals that the clear leader is Jay Rasulo, who ran the business from May 2000 to September of 2002 when it was known as Euro Disney. So it was actually more profitable by this metric uh, while it was Euro Disney and uh, needed to refit. By the way, Ray, Jay Rasulo was in charge of, of turning around these parks in order to raise the uh, financial futures of these parks. During each of the three years he was in charge, the company made an operating profit. And crucially, it came to a combined total of 581 million or uh, 536.7 million euros uh, there in, uh, in in euro dollars there. Uh, Vash, I think you've got a, a, a an interesting revelation also out of Caroline Reed to share with us. Please, sir, take it away. We do, we do. Here we go from Caroline Reed right here from Forbes. Revealed the Disney-owned theme park that pays $170 million to use its characters. Wait, so this, this, isn't, is this isn't Tokyo Disneyland? <laughs> this is not Tokyo Disneyland. This is Disneyland Paris, uh, which is interesting that they work under this structure right here. Like you said, uh, it's a structure very similar to uh, Tokyo, uh, but also in the fact that they, they pay a royalty fee for the use of characters, IPs, licensing, and all, all of that. However, it's also kind of, it goes back to 1955, interestingly enough, and how Disneyland, when it wasn't fully owned by the Walt Disney Company, well, they had to pay for uh, the usage of characters as well, which is very, very interesting. We'll get to that stuff in a moment right here. If there was ever a business which has found the magic formula for making profits is its Disney's uh, theme park division. Last year alone, it generated 69.6% of the media giants, $12.9 billion in operating income. That's profit, folks. 70% of the profit of the entire company uh was found within the experiences division the experiences division made up that much of it uh on just 36.6 percent of the revenue it is partly thanks to a controversial trick tucked up vicky's sleeve uh what is that well let's 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 find out now on the face of it theme parks have been a simple business model according to the international association of amusement parks and uh, attractions right here between 55 and 60 percent of revenue comes from entry tickets with 25 percent to 30 percent coming from dining and merchandise and the remainder generated by licensing sponsorship special events it, it talks about it a little bit here in this uh, uh in these couple paragraphs in the article right here it talks about how you don't necessarily make a profit from ticket entry it's just kind of there to cover the costs of the operation of these theme parks. And in some cases they don't even cover that. So where is a lot of this, uh, you know, additional revenue or I should say a uh, profit found? Well, it's in all the stuff you buy afterwards, right? It's the food sales. It's the merchandise sales. It, you know, it's all of the, it's the extra. It's, 
it, Genie it's Plus the things that sales. Would, uh, generally come with brand awareness at a park like this more than it is getting people in the door. It is a is a venture in trying to keep the brand relevant in that space and sell more merchandise. Right, exactly. Food, beverage, and merchandise have the highest margins. So the more guests who stream through the turnstiles, the higher the profit is for the park operator. This is why capacity is has been so crucial and why you want to have uh, more guests because you have more people to spend on them. Of course, those per caps are definitely the metric you want to look out for or the the uh, we call it the average revenue per user in the streaming uh, space, but per caps is the metric that you use for uh, figuring out how much uh, people actually spend per guest at your theme park right here. So far, so simple. However, that is just the start of the story for Disney. One of its resorts pays it pays it just for opening its doors, and last year it stews rose by 32.2% to a record $166.5 million or 156 million euros. The resort is Disneyland Paris, which ironically is seen as one of Disney's least profitable out, uh, outposts. We'll go ahead and talk about uh, in, in, in that in a moment, but it is actually anything but that. Disneyland Paris is Europe is the most visited attraction, yada, yada, yada there. Uh, this is a very, very complex story here because essentially when and Disneyland Paris was 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 first coming up here. Uh, they the the French government offered I think the uh, 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 a landmass the fifth the size of Paris itself, oh which goodness. is quite fascinating right there. It's it's huge. So you're talking about you know seven on-site hotels, two convention centers, twenty-seven whole uh, golf course uh, golf course, and two theme parks right here. This is a this is a huge you know, a landmass of, of all these attractions. However, the only way that, uh, that, that Disney um, could actually purchase that, that, that amount of land and set up this kind of operation uh, was if they took a minority stake in the business. Disney wanted more, but the French government wouldn't allow them to do that. So with that minority stake, it was like, okay, we're going to invest so much into getting this established right here. How do we actually make money from this exhibition that is only going to leave us in a, in, a, in a minority position, at least at the first get? Uh, they decided to put on all of these fees and licensing and to really kind of augment the revenue that was coming out of uh, 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 Disneyland Paris for themselves right here. However, they may have gone a little bit overboard, as the article brings out here. This is fascinating to me. And, and, and of course, this would end up being the model for the Shanghai Park as well because Disney does not own, they don't have a majority stake in that Shanghai park. They're essentially allowing yep. someone else to use the Disney light. It's a license just like it is in Tokyo, except that they own more of the park outright. They do not control it in any way. They still have to get the permission of uh, the Chinese government and therefore the <clears throat> controlling party out there in order to do this. So I, I, I think that this Disneyland Paris structure is probably where they got most of the ideas for that. And you could probably j blame or credit Jay Rasulo for most of this uh, financial wizardry. Uh, you, one could make the argument. Yes. Uh, and it was a, it was like a public private partnership, which is interesting. You know, usually when these things are engaged in uh, there's like a parent LLC or, or whatever. And, and that's sort of the, what, what happens here. However, because it's more, it was at least for a period of time more public than it was private. They had to Disney had to be forthright in what their expansion plans were. They had to, you know, give blueprints models to the bankers to get loans. It's a very interesting structure here. And that brings us to expansion, right? So uh, in uh, Disney was it as the graph below shows since Disneyland parks ornate iron gates swung open in 1992, EDA, that's uh, the Euro Disneyland, essentially, uh, company, has paid Disney the blockbuster total of $1.9 billion in royalties and management fees. So that is a huge sum. And if people are looking at these uh, numbers and remembering if they correlate with anything else, well, that is the amount that Disney is expected to put into 
uh, their big expansion plans for now Disney Adventure World, which is interesting, a two billion euro expansion right Wait, there. So, so you're telling taking... me that uh, from a financial standpoint, it seems that Disney is permanently reinvested over there in Europe and is not bringing that money back to the United States. Hmm, I wonder if that's a great way to avoid taxation on that uh, on those figures over there uh, yes yes and the article does go into that quite extensively as well uh, this this also seems to be to me that that walt disney world might be the only fully profitable resort complex that they have here i know california is it, uh, california has to be profitable for them and but but at the same time if if an article came out revealing that it's not actually profitable i would not be surprised at this point, Walt Disney World Resorts, the U.S. parks are 75% or more of all of the revenue for parks. If you cut out those other parks, the figures might even skew a little bit better on offer operating profits versus operating expenses. Uh, sorry, operating income versus operating expenses. To me, I don't understand why they are so down on the U.S. parks, specifically Walt Disney World, when Disneyland Paris doesn't make them any money. Hong Kong... Uh, in, in Shanghai, if they offend the wrong person in the government, they do, won't even own those parks anymore. So I, I don't I don't get it why they are so focused on these international parks when they seem to be a glory, a glory metric more than an actual or a vanity metric other than something that actually brings them in any reasonable amount of money. I it's it's <laughs> it's amazing, really, because I think Hong Kong has only had a profitable year i think once in its history if i recall correctly it was just some crazy metric that was like what are you doing here uh like i said the, that part partial ownership stake in those licensing fees really increases that output for sure uh at least for walt disney's side of things but you can see the the kind of the final part of this graph this is why they're investing so much in the international market right here you can see that kind of revenue growth uh as we get further along here especially after disney increases its stake to i think it's like 90 percent uh, for disneyland paris right now and and that's also one of the reasons why they're investing so much that they are uh into disney adventure world right there you can see just that kind of climb on the revenue side of things and this is kind of the short-term thinking strategy of the walt disney company right now you have a lot of people who aren't going to be there to necessarily see the consequences of their actions unfortunately you can see this this exponential growth in recent years and they mm -hmm. have seen this in uh, not not so much hong kong but definitely shanghai it's like okay is our money spent better spent on these newer products rather than our legacy products in uh in orlando and disneyland that's the calculation that they're making and why they're spending so much uh in these other places i'm not saying it's a great strategy i'm just saying that's why they're doing it and it's it's uh bizarre yeah, I, I, I totally agree. This is such an odd company right here. At this point, it seems to be more of a political and PR arm of, 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 of I guess, a, a streaming service that doesn't seem to be making that much money. The, uh, I, I More and more each day, I question the business philosophy behind the Walt Disney Company, and especially as it destroys its own brands. But uh, I'll throw this to the commenters after I've said something so incredibly negative. Uh, what do you think about this situation? Are they making any money over there in Paris, or are we just, or are we missing something here? We very well could miss something here. Vash, what am I missing? Well, I, I want to bring up one thing. I, I was bringing it all the way back to Disneyland right here, and and a lot of people don't know, but the early days of Disneyland, because it wasn't wholly owned by the Walt Disney Company. In fact, it, 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 it I believe their stake was a partial ownership stake of of around. Oh, it was only a couple of percentage points early on because ABC owned 30 percent, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, when Disneyland first opened, they didn't have the rights to the characters yet. And that didn't come until the 1960s. So if you look there, they've got some people in costume and opening day. I'm not saying they, they don't have that. But if you look at some of those early 50s photographs, you'll nary see a character that you recognize. Sure, you'll see a lot of in park characters for sure, like the spaceman, you know, if you've ever seen that. But you'll not see Mickey. Uh, Minnie or some of these more iconic characters. And uh, that wasn't until 
Disney fully owned Disneyland until they were able to incorporate those characters in there. So it's kind of similar in a lot of ways. Uh, history doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme, right, Jonas? <laughs> That's a very good statement right there. All right, I'm going to like this video because Vash said that. But if you want to like this video, I'm going to let you do that too. Of course, like it if you like it. And uh, consider subscribing to That Park Place for all the news that should be fun. Thanks for watching That Park Place News. For more information, consider checking out www.thatparkplace.com. And don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and send this out on your favorite social media accounts.